Uh, title of the talk is Something, Something, Something Dark Side, and that's because I couldn't think of the title. Uh, people might want to know where I got the title. And I got that title from, and I close YouTube. Never mind. It's a Family Guy reference. <laughs> And if any of you don't know about Family Guy, well, I don't really care. But my talks here have always been, from the first time Gene broke me into doing something, I've always done desktop machines. And that's because everybody else has already done every variation of the handhelds. You guys know more about the handhelds than I ever will. And the last two talks I did were on desktops, and they seem to go fairly well, so I'm going to do more desktops. So, we have the HP Model 10 calculator, aka the 9810, and the 9820A calculator. So, why these particular machines? Well, everybody remembers the 9100, right? The first desktop calculator? It had individual transistors. The CPU had 40 transistors. We just got finished testing a CPU from Intel that had like 4 billion transistors, so we've come a ways. But mag core memory and the ROM was this like weird inductive coupling 16 layer PC board and wire rope. It was just, you know, cutting edge in every conceivable way, such that the only way you could really describe it was magic. But it did work. And they sold a bunch of them. And sent Wang scurrying. And the thing about Magic is, Magic's very expensive. Uh, the computers, the 9100s were, I think, $5,000 a pop. They had three kilobits of memory, little custom CRTs. But then, just a couple of years later, they came out for 9810 and 9820 because suddenly we had digital ICs available. We didn't have to use mag core memory anymore. We had LEDs, so we didn't have to use those expensive little electrostatic deflection CRTs. So why these two particular machines? Well, the 9810 and the 9820 were the first HP calculators that we would actually recognize, that an engineer would sit down and design and build with standard industry parts as opposed to something like the 9100, which was like bubble, bubble, coil, and trouble, which is magic. The other thing is that the 9810 and the 9820 are interesting because they are physically pretty much the same machine. They have the same memory, the same CPU, the same card reader, the same printer. The only things that are different are the keyboards, the displays, and the firm, what we would call today the firmware. In fact, uh, you could, I, in my research I found that HP actually offered an upgrade from the 9810 to the 9820, which was a new keyboard display module a new firmware, and we'll see why they'd want to do that later. So the thing that made these machines possible, the, the, the tipping point in technology development was this. Anybody recognize this? I'm sure a couple of people do. It's an S123. Yeah. You know what an S120, an S120, it's a little unusual. The standard part number most people would recognize is 1103. Come on, come on. How many of you guys know what the 1103 is? Because I was talking to you about it. Is that a 1K reaction? Yes. Yes, it is. This is the first electronic memory chip, the Intel 1103. For, for whatever reason, they are often labeled S123. Nobody seems to know why. This is a dynamic memory chip. And to give you an idea of how far we come, it would take 128 million of those to give you a 16 gigabyte iPhone. Yeah. That's a big iPhone. That's a big iPhone, yeah. Well, the iPhone only has one gig of RAM. Yeah. Uh, yeah, but 16 gig of storage. That's a, Eric's is better. It would really only take 128 million divided by 16. So, uh, if you pull the top off either of those two machines in the back, it'll look pretty much the same. You've got a memory thing, which is actually I have a spare. Looks like this. And it's one, two, three, four, five cards in the base unit. And then right next to that in blue, you can see we have a five card, a four card CPU. Then there's a big blank space where my photo unit does not have a printer. You have two single board controllers for the printer and tape drive. 
a printer and card reader, sorry, and then a nice modular power supply. And it's not, you can't really quite see it in this image, but they're actually, HP put test points, holes in that metal plate. So if you were actually trying to troubleshoot the unit, you could just poke your probes right in those little test points. I'm sorry? A little louder, please. A little louder, please. Where's the real microphone? Richard has it. Oh, Richard has it. Okay. Should I start from the beginning? No. Okay. Uh, the person who said I was not speaking loudly enough was saying that when I was talking about the test points and the power supply. You can see this, it's not very clear in this slide, but there and there are places you can poke your probes if you suspect something might be wrong with the power supply. Of course, what any of us would normally do is just grab the Junk 9810 out of the garage and stop the power supply. The thing I like about these desk calculators is, well, how many people here have repaired the card readers in one of the little handheld card readers? Several of you. So you know it is a, it's not super difficult, but it's finicky and tedious. You have to do five or six of them, and you'll probably lose one of those little two millimeter nylon balls. It's just a pain in the butt. Here's the card reader out of one of those guys. And the O-rings you use have like a one inch diameter. Really, really easy to work on. There aren't any sense switches because you start the card reader with a switch on the keyboard. So all it is is a motor, a head. And this one works, by the way. Very, very easy to work on. Uh, the one thing that's a little odd is it bends the card almost 180 degrees in its passage to the reader. But interestingly enough, I have never had one of these cards split, crack, bend. You would think oxide would come off a 40-year-old mag card being bent 180 degrees. Nope, works fine. Memory. You have this guy. And each of the five cards in this is different. If you were thinking of a modern computer, and I pulled out a cage of cards and told you this was the memory, you would think each card would just have a bunch of memory chips on it. Each card in here is different. And I don't know exactly what each of them does, because finding really detailed information in this is quite difficult. I was able to find the official HP service manual for these machines. And basically says if you have a memory problem, you swap out this entire cage. Your, your kit as an HP service person will consist of these, and you take the customers out, plug this in, and let us worry about what's wrong with it. But you can pull it out. Uh, here is part number 09810 aka the 51 register board. This is the minimum complement you got for your program storage. You will notice several interesting things about this board. For one thing, notice those pretty gold-colored traces. They are gold-colored because they are, in fact, gold. Every trace in the computer, the motherboard, every board in the thing is gold-plated. That's another nice thing about these old desktop calculators. If you find one of the old handhelds, most of the time you're going to see some corrosion. Even if the owner took the batteries out and is sitting in normal humidity air for 40 years, that's not the case with these gold machines. I've never seen any corrosion. It's possible. I've heard, you know, it's just the gold plating over tin and it can peel off, but I've mm -hmm. never seen it happen. So generally when you get one of these old calculators, you open it up, you blow it out the can of compressed air, check for any bad capacitors, and generally the electronics just work, which is really nice. Uh, I couldn't identify these memory chips. They're very pretty. They're gold and white ceramic. Each one has a different part number. <laughs> Uh, and the bottom row is labeled 0 to 7, and the top row is labeled 8 to 15, 16-bit words. Probably. We'll get to that in a moment. Next, this is the board that has all those 11 <coughs> static memory chips. And if you count, you'll see there are 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. I have no idea. Perfect. If anybody has any idea why this chip why this computer would use 11 1K memory chips. Error correction. Could be 10 bit and with the error correction coming. Could be. I've, I haven't seen any reference to error correction, but you know, these were early DRAMs. Maybe a cosmic ray could flip them. Who knows? Next, this is the control ASCII. That's what HP calls it. Uh, I see some transistors down there in the lower right hand corner. Maybe it generates the refresh signal for the dynamic RAMs. Maybe it drives the address. Who knows? You know, the 
One thing I was hoping, and some of you probably made the same mistake I did, I looked down the list of attendees and I said, hot oh, shit, Katie Wasserman is coming. I've always wanted to meet her. She knows these systems inside out. I can ask her all these questions. Of course, I was really reading Katie Wasserman's thing. So. Glad to know my wife disappointed you. <laughs> yes. Okay, well, someday I'll meet her. This board, and this is a little interesting, although it's in the memory cage, according to the service manual, this is the processor's M register. It's a 16 bit serial shift register. Now, what is that, you might ask? Well, you recall me mentioning that the 9100, the original transistor-based calculator, was quite expensive, and it was. It had a full 16-bit wide data bus throughout the machine. One of the ways they tried to reduce the cost, and this machine came in about half the cost of the 9100, two ways. One, they went to solid-state circuits. Well, that was all solid-state. They went to ICs instead of individual transistors and bag core and such. And two, it has a one-bit data bus. This is a bit serial machine. Internally, the processor is 16 bits, but it all gets serialized. It goes over a one-bit bus. And that's why if you're looking at these boards and seeing how giant thick these traces are, that's because, you know, giant thick traces are more reliable, especially with the connection with the technology at the time. You get less crosstalk, less impedance. And they would have had to put a whole lot more traces in the board if they tried to maintain a 16-bit data path. It probably would have had to go to a multi-layer board. As far as I can tell, these are all just front back, you know, one layer boards. And I identified these 7495 four bit shift registers. There are four of them in that board that give you 16 bits. And this board implements the processor's T register. You could have optional memory boards that gave you, remember if we went back here and I said this was the 51 register board? You'll notice there's one open slot in this card cage. And you could put in one more board that would give you. 111, 1,012, or 2036 additional registers. But you could only have one of those boards. You couldn't pull out the original board and put in two. So next, let's take a look at the processor. Now, the 9810 processor is built in a 22 nanometer process. It's got eight cores, a quad channel DDR4 memory controller, and 30 megabytes of on-chip level three cache. 2.6, what? Okay, sorry about that, wrong processor. That was the one Intel sent me a few weeks ago to play with, and it's a very nice processor. Uh, as with a lot of this old HP iron, the CPU was based on the old 2114 mini computer HP sold in the 60s. To fit this kind of power in a desktop machine that you could sell for less than $20,000, they went with this bit serial architecture we discussed. It makes things a lot simpler, but it does make things slower especially given the clocks are running at the time. You have to take your 16-bit word and then parcel it out a bit at a time and then reassemble it at the other end where it's needed. Partially to make up for this, there is a board in the calculator that implements BCD arithmetic, which is actually really cool for a calculator. Anybody not know what I mean when I say BCD arithmetic? Well, of course everybody knows what I mean. Just an interesting thing, probably about 85% of the people we've ever interviewed for temporary contracting positions don't know what BCD is. Really? Yeah. Ask them about Epsidic. <laughs> <laughs> Interestingly, uh, and a little disappointingly, and William Hewlett apparently was upset about this, the 9810 is actually slower than the 9800 because of this one bit thing. But it cost half as much as the 9800 and frankly, it had a lot of other features. The one feature, if you're used to programming calculators, the feature you'll really use a lot is you'll notice you'll do a lot of loops. And it's hard to do loops in a 9100 because the 9100 doesn't have any kind of index register or indirect addressing. And so you can't stick a number in a register and then loop. You can, but you have to pull it out, subtract, do the compare yourself. And there's no indirection. You can't store a 5 in register 0 and then do an indirect store into 0 to put something in register 5. So if you're doing any kind of loop that wants to walk the registers, uh, you just can't do it. On a 9100, a 9810, no problem. I can't find very much information at all in the processor. I can be glib and say, oh, it's based on the 2114 mini computer. Well, I can't find much about that either. Apparently it had about 75 instructions. Apparently it was a 16-bit machine. I don't know if that means 16-bit address bus, 16-bit registers, probably both. 
Uh, I was hoping Katie was here because if anybody would know, it would be Katie, but Katie's not here. So, sorry about that. If anybody does know anything about this processor, the. You do? No. But oh, damn it. <laughs> Have you talked to the people at the Computer Museum in Mountain View, California? I actually made a donation to them of an old uh, Mac prototype. Because they do Maybe repair very, months. very old machines and they rebuild cards and stuff. So they may have people. I could ask. In them. my experience, they are they're nice folks, but for example, if they had a complete set of technical docs in this calculator, they would not let me come in and look at them. And I know this because when I got a TI SR60 calculator, I couldn't find any manuals. And I found that the computer museum did have the manuals. Oh, can I come in and look at them? No. Can I just come in and like, you know, scan them, make a copy of them? Take, take, no. We'll do that for you. 50 cents a page. If you become a member for $300. And by the way, we'll do a really crappy job of it. So I love the computer museum. In fact, I'm hoping next year we can have a meeting in San Jose just so we can all do a side trip to the computer museum in Mountain View, because if you haven't seen it, it's freaking incredible. However, as a resource for people like us, not so much. Getting back to the processor, spread across four PC boards. I'm, I have virtually no information. I don't know how the processor is implemented. I don't know what the various boards do. All I can do is show you a photo of the board and say this is what the service manual calls it. So again, if anybody has any knowledge about what this is, wave your hand up and I don't know. This is the I.O. board. I.O. to what? Well, who the hell knows? Uh, my guess is talking to the display, keyboard, printer, and card reader, but again, I don't know. This is where uh, Tony Jewell would sniff condescendingly and say, didn't you get out your logic probe and just trace the signals, then you would know what it does. No, Tony, sorry, don't know how to use a logic probe. This is the clock board. Now, see that gigantic crystal in the upper left-hand corner? That's a man's crystal. None of these little match head sized things hooked up to a frequency synthesizer like the kids these hey, days careful. use. I work for the company that developed the tuning <laughs> Did he? And in fact, on the back of that board, those contacts come out to two big test points, big enough to put little alligator clips on. So if you want to put your own clock signal into the system, you know, you can't buy an HP calculator that is designed to let you inject your own clock signal into the system. Can you tell? We're going to speed it up. Yeah, overclocking the 9810. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, there are, there are test points in the. Uh, among other calculators, the 65, to let you do exactly that. I'm wrong. They did do that something. Uh, Eric tells me the HP 65 had test points that would let you inject your clock signal. So all of you guys with 65s that want to try overclocking them, let me know how that turns out. And Eric says he's got one you can borrow to experiment with. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh, I am pretty sure that this is most of the processor because the service manual calls this the microprocessor board. I did look up some part numbers and that really big chip at the top center is a SM74150 multiplexer and I know that's the chip that handles the serialization and deserialization. What's also interesting is you can go to Mauser Electronics and order one of those chips today. Interesting, they don't sell the 1103 RAMs anymore for what that's worth. And this is the ALU register, and I'm guessing this board is where all the BCB stuff is done. But again, don't know. Something else is a little different compared to what we see today. If we see a computer with a bus or a back plane, we expect all the slots to be the same. Not the way it used to be. This is the CPU back plane, and each board has a very specific slot and will not fit in any other slot. And if you ever do get one of these machines and you're taking the boards out and blowing them off and sticking them back in and you have never seen one of these machines before and you haven't bothered to look and notice, gee, the slots are actually physically different, you might come very close to really boogering stuff up as you're going, get in there, get in there, get in there, before you notice that the board you're trying to put in doesn't fit in that slot. So, word to the wise there. Although these calculators are very similar electronically, in fact, most of the parts will just swap right out Programming and usage is very different. The 9810 is a 
old style RPM calculator, and it's programmable, but it's much easier to use as a calculator. The 9820 is clunky to use as a calculator, but it's much, much easier to program. The 9810 has the exact same RPM as 9100, and if you haven't used any of these really old machines before, it's a little weird. It's a three-level stack. Unary operations like cosine, log, whatever, operate in the X register, and the result falls in the X register, just as you'd expect. Binary operators like multiplication or addition leave the result in the Y register. It's a little weird, but that's the way it works. And also, there is no automatic stack lift or drop like we're used to in the more modern machines. So if you say 2, enter 3 times, you end up with the 6 in the Y register and the 2 in the X register. If you then wanted to take the sign of 6, you'd have to roll it down to the X register before pressing the sign. It's a little odd, but there are some if you, if you look at it, you begin to see that the automatic stack lift and drop we have in the handhelds is basically a consequence of only having one stack level displayed at once. Because you couldn't see what was in the Y register because your calculator only has one line, so it made sense when you finish multiplying to pull it into the X register automatically. And frankly, it's easier to work with because it eliminates some keystrokes. The 9810 has four functional sections to the keyboard from the left to right. They are a user-definable block. These old calculators have ROM cartridges that plug into the top just above the display, and these will come with a little printed metal overlay that defines these keys. In this example, we have a mathematics cartridge. The next keys over are memory and stack manipulation. Although the calculator has at least 51 memories, they bring the first or the last two, I should say, A and B up to little dedicated keys for convenience. And you'll notice we have a Y right arrow parentheses that store Y into a numbered register, store X into a numbered register, pull X out of a numbered register, swap Y with a numbered register, and that indirect key in the middle, which just makes all the difference. In fact, it's a little interesting that we couldn't do this. Boy, I'm not sure if any of the handhelds do this. You can have as many levels of indirection as you want. You can say X store into indirect 5, and that would store X into whatever memory register 5 pointed to. But you could say X store into indirect, 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 indirect 5, and it would just walk the chain, and there's no upper limit to it. I don't think even the 41 offers more than one level of indirection. Now nobody's saying yes it does, so I guess I'm right. I, I don't know, I find that kind of creepy. There should be a limit. Three levels of indirection. It's not in one by. statement, no. Okay. But you can do recall whatever, then recall indirect. Say recall indirect X, recall the... Uh, yeah. yeah. Recall indirect zero and then recall indirect zero. Yeah. No, re recall indirect X, recall indirect X, because then whatever's in X, it pulls it. So oh, yeah. Yeah. oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. That's kind of weird, too. Yeah. yeah, but that would work. But that's using the stack. As, with the X, yeah. That's using yeah. the stack as a memory register, which I've always thought is just weird. Don't do that. But it won't work with the store, only the Yeah, uh, only the you're changing X. Uh, next we have the numeric pad, and my two observations is it would have been nice to have the enter key here, and why is the square root key here, but there you go. And last we have programming control keys. There's only, you see the if flag and set flag, there's only one flag and testing it clears it. So once you say if flag, after that, the flag is guaranteed to be zero. That's a little weird. You can have up to five levels of subroutines. Down at the lower right, you can see back step and step. You can walk backwards and forwards through the program. What you can't do are insert or delete steps. And yeah, that sucks big time. I'll get to that in a moment. What the manual suggests you do, say you need to insert steps, you've got a 200 step program and you need to insert something at step 100, what you do is you fire up the card reader and you say record the program starting at step 101, stick a card in, type in your new steps, then you fire up the card reader and say read the card and stick it starting at step 103, <sighs> which is just as tedious as you would think. Uh, there's another little problem. Note at the very bottom there, if a conditional test fail, the next four program steps are skipped. That's so you can say, 
if x not equal to y, go to 1, 2, 3. The only problem with that is that if you had the extended memory, you could have four digit program addresses. So in that point, you had to have a go-to label and some no-ops instead of a go-to absolute numeric address. Uh, the print space key will print the contents of X. A subsequent print space key will just <coughs> advance the printer. And here's something I found writing my demo programs. I said, you could use labels instead of line numbers. And I said, but I wouldn't bother. First, since you can't insert or delete, your absolute addresses won't change often. Second, label searches always start at step zero and search. The label searches or go-to labels are kind of slow. However, when I was writing the example program, I had like five places in the program where I say go to number thing. And I had so many times I had to go back and change and rewrite things, then I had to calculate all those new addresses again every freaking time. If I were writing the example program again, I would probably do labels because, yes, the program is slower, but it would have been done much, much, much sooner. Uh, the TI SR60 that I gave a talk here back in 2011, I think, one interesting thing is after you typed in a program, when you took it out of program mode, it would sit there and the display would flicker for like five seconds. And what it does is build a little internal jump table of label addresses. And they're updated on the fly and then sort of delete. So that's kind of nice. But that's a TI, so we're not going to give them credit for that. <coughs> Using in programming, uh, I've already talked about it's a little odd in that unary functions operate in the value of the X register and return the result in the X register, but binary functions end up in the Y register. And as I said, if you've never used one of these old calculators before, it, it takes a while to get used to because you have to manually roll the stack down and roll it back up to do things. So if you do 3 enter 4 times, you'll get 12 in the Y register, 3 in the X register, and if you want to take the sign of the 12, you have to roll it back down first. Three up arrow, four times down arrow sign. And then if you immediately want to operate on the sign, like multiply it by four and you say four times, oops, when you hit the four, it just overwrote your result because there is no automatic stack lift after an operation on these old calculators. On these modern RPM machines, well, up to the 40, up to but not including the 41, you can only store to and store from and recall to the X register but since the 9810 leaves results in the Y register, the separate keys to store and recall directly to Y. And I've discussed the A and B registers. The program. You've got your three stack levels. Keystrokes, this is interesting. I've got two 9810s, one that more or less works, and the one I've got here where everything works. On this one, as I type in key codes, they always go into the Y register. The X register. If I'm starting from scratch, the X register always displays zero for a key code. What I've typed displays in the Y register, and the thing I typed before that goes to Z. On the other 9810, things I type go into the Z register. If they work the same other than that, so that's a little weird. Now, the fun part about, pro there are many fun parts about programming 9810. This is key codes. You can see here, like step seven is a uh, 36, step eight is 40, and step nine is 31. And you say, that's no big deal. I've had a 65, 67. You just memorize the key codes after a week or so. You'll, you'll just, your mind will insert the key codes or the keys for you. No, it won't. <laughs> Two reasons. Uh, one, the key codes on the 65 and the 67 and the 41 make sense. They are row column of the keys. So even if you don't recall that, you know, 42 is a store, you can go, oh, row four, column two, there it is. The key codes in the 9810 are assigned to keys at random. And you might think, oh, he is exaggerating for humorous effect. No, I'm not. Here is an example. There's a chart in the 9810 manual, and here are the keys, and here are the key codes written under them in yellow. And if you look, they're pretty much random. I can't, I can't come up with anything. The, the numbers, and they're octal, by the way, too. So the only ones that I know off the top of my head are 0 through 9, and that's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 1, 0, 1, 1, because they're octal. Might they happen to match 9100 key codes? Not as far as I know, but I haven't actually checked. You know, we could go get the 9100, bring it here and check. That's why if you have one of these, and you really 
want this ROM that says printer alpha because if you have a printer but you don't have the printer alpha ROM, the program listing looks exactly like this thing here except it's on paper. If you do have the printer alpha ROM, which was something like $300 extra, then your program listings look like this and you can actually read them. That is a Katie Wasserman tip. I did not know about the program alpha or the printer alpha ROM until she told me. Also, fortunately, we use standard two and a quarter inch thermal paper available at any office supply store. Buy it by the case if you plan to play with this calculator because you're going to be using a lot of it. Let's, example, let's implement my demo program. My demo program, we all have our favorite demo programs. My demo program is a program that finds all three digit numbers equal to the sums of the cubes of their digits. The first one is 153 because one cubed plus three cubed plus five cubed is 153. So the first thing I do is I compute the cubes of the integers zero through nine and store those in registers so I can index into them later. So here is the 9810 code to do that. I won't walk through the code, but notice that it took 21 steps just to do that. And I'm going to put the rest of the program listing into the appendix because it's 153 more steps. And it's really <coughs> tedious. How many of you guys have ever done assembly language programming? Very good. This is very, very similar. I mean, the, the individual, I mean, it's a step above assembly language because, like, a sign would only take one instruction, but still, it's really, really basic stuff. So, and you have to kind of get into the assembly mindset of I have to keep track of everything. In fact, uh, I was talking to somebody over there, and I forget who, I'm sorry, but he, he brought up the point with these old calculators, it really made more sense to get a piece of paper and write the program out in longhand first. Was that you? Who was that? That was you. Okay. Uh, he's absolutely correct. I wish I had done that, but I thought, oh, I'll just do it off the top of my head. <laughs> you really want to, in fact, I have, and I should have brought them, I didn't. I have, HP sold these big, thick programming pads with line numbers that you can work on, and those would make your life a lot easier. Yes? Five more minutes? Yeah, that's fine. Thank you. Okay. The 9820 is much, much nicer to program, much, much nicer, although not as convenient to use as a keystroke calculator. Here's the keyboard of the 9820. It's got three chunks of user-definable keys, numeric pad, and program control pad. The thing you will like most about the 9820 is those. You can insert and delete program steps. Thank you. I originally had thank you, God. And my wife made me take that out and put in thank you, HP. <laughs> Uh, this is just a look at some of the user-definable keys for mathematics. Uh, here's the numeric pad. We've got an execute key because the 9820 is an algebraic calculator, not an RPN calculator. <coughs> so if you wanted to do 2 times 3, it's 2 times 3 execute, you get 6. Wait, can you go back? I can. So change sign is actually the minus key, or is that how you put it in, like minus two would be? Yeah, you just put in minus two. two. Okay. Minus two times six would give minus twelve. Okay. Uh, the common quote key is it's an alphanumeric display, and so you can put in little printed text messages, which is very nice. Uh, a, B, C, X, Y, and Z are, again, single stroke keys for memory registers. The right arrow key is an assignment key, and the R parentheses key is for numbered memory registers. So if you wanted to put something into a numbered memory register, you would say, like, right arrow, R, 50, store. The store button, you type in a line and hit store, and that stores it as a program line. Stop and run program are obvious, and you have the comparisons. This language, when you, it's a keystroke language, but when you look at it on the display or printing, it looks a lot like basic. And what it really is is both the very first iteration of what's called the HPL, and something like the 9825, and some of the calculators that came after that. Uh, the last calculation results are always put into Z. So if you type in like uh, sign open print 45 execute, and you get the sign of 45, and then you want to add something to that, but you can't because it's in the display now and it's an algebraic calculator. You just say plus Z, and Z will automatically have the result of the last calculation in it. 
Uh, indirect addressing is you hit the R key twice. So if you want something, let's see, do I mention that in the next slide? I mentioned it somewhere. Uh, so if you wanted to recall, if you wanted the whatever's in register 5 to be an address of another register, you would hit R, R, 5. And like the 9810, you can hit it as many times as you want until you run out of memory. You can have 100. I've personally tested 50 levels in the direction and it worked. So that's something else I think is creepy. Yep, yep. You can go to an absolute line number, a relative line number, like a jump or a label. 9820 does build a jump table for absolute go-to's, although apparently not for labels, so that's weird. Pressing any of the alpha keys, A, B, C, X, Y, Z, immediately recalls its value, numeric registers. Oh, I do get into the indirection here, sorry. But yes, as I noted, even in here, it is slightly confusing. The 9820 is an RPM calculator internally. Every time you type a line in and hit store, it is, it is compiled into RPN, and every time you review a program line, bring it back to display, it's decompiled back into algebraic. Again, I have absolutely no details on how this is accomplished. Not terribly convenient to use a calculator. If you use an algebraic calculator like a TI and you want to take the sine of 83, you punch 83 sine. On the 9820, you have to get sine first, then 83, then execute. So it is, a, it is a really pure algebraic, and this makes it a little clunky to use just as a calculator. You can change your evaluation using the parentheses. Programming language is similar to BASIC. I've, I've covered some of this before out of order here. That 9810 program, a few slides back, where I told you it was so long and tedious I wasn't even going to show you, here's the entire program for the 9820. It builds a table of the cubes the first three digits, then iterates 1 through 999, gets the cube of each digit, sucks it out, compares it. If it's equal to some of the cubes of their digits, it prints it. And this has two extra lines that print the name of the program and print done when it's over. And this literally took less than two minutes for me to type in, run, fix one bug, and it was done. The 9810 version took over two hours. <laughs> because I kept running it, it would just go away because I had branched one line off and uh, it was hideous pain, hideous pain. The 9820 is slightly slower. The threes program takes 32 seconds to run in the 9810, 45 seconds to run in the 9820, and three seconds to run in my Apple III. So 6502 will stop all over these guys. Information, Hewlett Packard manuals, Museum of HP Calculators, HP Computer Museum, the guy in Australia who has the most wonderful selection of manuals, hp9825.com, which oddly enough has a lot of information about these guys, and hpmemory.org. Now, we will quickly go over every single line of the 9810 program. <laughs> quickly go over. <laughs> no, not really. And that is all of that. Uh, I'm running over, but I could probably take one or two questions if anybody has any. Like, why did I bother? No, what? Yes? Does that count as a real RPN machine, or is that not an RPN machine? I don't know anything in the definition of RPN that relates to the stack. I don't know anything in the RPN definition that says you actually have to do an automatic push if you enter a number after an operation. So, I would ask the Polish guy, Leibowitz, what's his name? Except he's dead. Luka Witch. Yes, thank you. Uh, I'll ask a mathematician. Namir, is this real RPN? No. No, it's not. Namir says it's not. <laughs> well, because if it was, if you would have stuck with that with the calculators, the fact that they redesigned and included automatic lifting and That was just an artifact of going to a one line display. Yeah, but I don't think there was well, well. communication between the, <clears throat> the calculator group and the well, te te technically, Polish notation is prefix notation, and, yeah. and, and RPN, reverse Polish, is suffix, and that has nothing to do with the behavior of the, of the display or whether there's automatic lift. It's, it's purely a matter of mathematical notation. Yeah. So, so I was right so, the first time saying yes. so you it. It's RPN, but it's not, it's not what we consider traditional R HP RPN, RPN, even though it came earlier. Yes, I've got one more question. Uh, just suggesting that for somebody here who has internet access and uh, is on we the all forum, do. perhaps uh, Katie Wasserman can be called up in effect and answer the questions you want to ask. I didn't hear the question. 
He says uh, if someone here has internet access, we should actually call Katie Wasserman and ask her some of these questions. Well, um, I would be too intimidated. I think you can start a thread on HP Museum <laughs> should have already responded. I wanted to get Katie out of our conferences, so I was communicating with her quite regularly on a basis. And, uh, uh, if it's not really close to White Plains, it's, it's, it's hard. I mean, she, she's 